We are Trucking Solutions Group. I'm Joel Bowman. I happen to be the vice chairman of the group this year. Um, our purpose, and Stephen, if you'd change the slide there, we are a group of professional owner operators, fleet owners, and uh, different carriers. We're striving to improve our industry through constantly growing and sharing our knowledge with everyone else. Um, we've acted as a professional focus group for um, different manufacturers and other groups, beta testing some products and services and trying to help um, potential impacts of proposed regulations and the rules for our industry. The group itself has about 280 years of trucking experience, 230 plus years as owner operators. Organizations we belong to besides this group are Trucker Buddy, Women in Trucking, Western States Trucking Alliance, Team Run Smart, OOIDA, Boy Scouts of America, Sons of the American Legion, Colorado Rock Hoppers, and we also are members of the Aluminum Foil Origami Society. Members on the stage with me today, starting clear over to the left is Linda Caffey, who happens to be our current chairperson. Her husband, Bob Caffey, is sitting next to her. Then we have Henry Albert, Sandy Goshi, Stephen Halstead, Mark Hegstadt, Jimmy Navares, Shane Rizzuto, myself, and the person to my right is not a member of our group other than honorary. He is going to be helping us after the introduction here. I'm about done talking. We're going to show you all the different topics we talk about when we get through these slides. Um, well, while that's going through, let me jump ahead here. We have a lot of guest speakers on. Some of them are truck stops reps from the oil industry, GPS representatives. Some of them are industry research. And we've had uh, API on with deaf quality insurance. Later on, there's going to be one slide that shows the myriad of different groups that have been guest speakers on our call. Some of the general topics we'll talk about are maintenance, new, new ways of keeping our trucks running, fuel discount programs. As we all know, probably the biggest expense of any truck is the fuel it takes. Truck stop issues, trailer registrations, sometimes where it's the least expensive to buy a trailer or to register a trailer. And then one of the last topics we call witty banner. That's basically where we tease each other. But it also comes in, we share the experience somebody might have had which leads to someone else knowing who to call to solve that problem. And then, like I said before, friendly ribbing and sometimes the aluminum foil. So when we get to it, right now I'm going to pretty much be done talking. If any one of you has a question on one of the topics that we showed up there, and we'll get to a slide here that kind of covers all that. 
We want you to ask about it. If you don't ask, this is where Bob comes in. He's going to ask the questions for it. And, it, you know, just keep the talk going. Right now, we're going to go very extemporaneous. And anybody have the first question for us? There you go, Bob. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, all. Glad you could be here today. Um, the first question I have, and anybody on the panel can take it, what are the top three issues facing trucking today? The top three issues. S Jimmy, and pass, pass the microphone to Jimmy. So, I mean, one of the main things, I'm, I'm out on the West Coast, and uh, where my trucks run, one of the biggest problems we have, especially near the Los Angeles area, up near the Bay Area and things like that, is truck parking. Everybody knows truck parking is a, a huge uh, problem out there. There's not enough of it for as many trucks that are on the road. So uh, some of the things we talk about when it comes to truck parking is where do we park a truck? You know, as a group, we're able to bounce things off each other and, and take topics like this and talk amongst each other, find solutions, come and network at trucking events, and we find things like apps where people are starting trucking and it's almost like you can rent a space kind of like you do for a uh, Airbnb or something like that for truck parking uh, things you find like that um, you network with other carriers use other yards you can uh, start to look on other parking apps that aren't quite like Airbnb they have set sites all over the country where you can start to park trucks but we see a lot of stuff going on with truck parking right now uh, a lot of people trying to find the solutions so one thing that we always keep keep on top of, especially with my drivers, is where are you parking and where are you safe at night? So that, that, that's one of our top issues. Okay. Um, Sandy, you want to, Sandy, you want to uh, list your top three? You want a second sure. problem? <laughs> well, in my case, co-drivers <laughs> is a big issue. Because sometimes uh, we have slight issues, and in a truck, it's kind of hard to slam the doors because there are no doors, especially when you're going down the road to slam, and curtains don't quite make the big noise that you want them to make. So that would be my issue number two, but I know that's not a proper one. And we'll go to Mark for the next issue. I think the next ex issue that's going to be a hot subject that's going to be discussed here in the next few months, I know it's been talked about here recently. Some of us maybe haven't experienced it, and maybe some have, but lately there's been a lot of calls that you get, uh, I like to call them telemarketers, but in the trucking industry, as myself, as an independent owner-operator, I am getting several calls for dispatch services. I can make you more money than you've ever made. Well, the first red flag I'm going to tell you is when they tell you that, there's probably too good to be true. So you've been hearing a lot about uh, double brokering, triple brokering, and the fraud out there. First question you ask, I would recommend asking is, first verify that they work with a broker or have a broker's license. And if they've got a broker's license, they should have an MC. Get that information. Get their phone number, because a lot of them are using robo numbers. So I suggest do your homework, check everything out. If you're uh, on a load board, looking at the spot markets, you know, using that for your freight to get back to wherever you need to be, if you've got regular freight getting out, again, do the research, verify. There's a lot of tools out there to verify. I mean, you got the safer system. You got FMCSA that you can go to. But right now, that is probably my biggest issue I'm running into is I can't begin to tell you how many times I've been on a call with some of these folks here and say, hey, i got to grab a call here. i got to put you on hold a moment. There's a lot of third-party agencies out there trying to make an extra dollar. And I heard a pretty sad horror story yesterday uh, that happened with a very legit large carrier. Uh, they brokered a load to a carrier. That carrier then brokered it to another carrier. That carrier brokered it to a third carrier. By the time it was said and done, the original load was po posted for $4,000. The last one agreed to pay $7,500. That load did not even pay $7,500. Uh, 
And the only way the first broker found out is somebody come looking for their money. And they had to tell them it wasn't even our load after that. So that's getting to be a real big issue, and that's where we all got to work together and communicate and share that information and share it with your peers. Thank you, Mark. Um, who else would like to? Henry, one of your top, top issues. I'd say one of the ones that people are having a hard time with is the modern technology that's employed in today's trucks and how you spec them out that they're going to be reliable and efficient so that you can get the best return on the investment that you put in it. And many of us, when we've ordered trucks, we've started bouncing specs back and forth. Some of us have relationships with the manufacturers of the trucks and, and bouncing back the information to get you where your maximum efficiency and return on the investment has been a very helpful part of this group as well. Along with having those relationships and knowing other people, I know different times people have had problems and they started sharing the problem they were experiencing with their truck. Somebody within the group knew somebody, and always somebody ends up knowing somebody that we can connect it and fix, and sometimes it's quite simple. You just had one of them yourself, Mark. Yeah, that, that's a great subject there, uh, Henry. How much it cost you to fix it? Well, I was looking at initially probably $5,000 plus, based on an initial walk-in quick assessment. As it turned out, it cost me some time, some phone calls with the peers here, and I was blessed enough that uh, it probably took me about a half hour of my time uh, to actually fix the problem. Uh, but cost-wise, it literally was no cost otherwise, but to find it, uh, was talking to the peers I was delivering, and that particular customer gave me a couple spare parts. We pinpointed where the problem was, and we fixed it. But I was looking at some pretty significant cost if I would have left it up to a mechanic shop to uh, go through with their diagnosis. Plus, you know, as well as downtime. And it was interesting because, uh, as Henry said, one of the fellow drivers in this group experienced the same problem I had, but just on the opposite end of where the problem was at. So with having a network like ourselves, that you could all do the same uh, communicating with one another or even reaching out to somebody in our group. We can help you with that. All right. Um, any questions in the audience yet? If you, raise your hand if you have any. All right, I'm going to jump to one of the topics brought up here, and it's parking. What is the solution to the parking problem? How is it solved? Who solves it? Um, yeah. You know, it takes, it takes an army to solve a problem like that. The, the real deal with parking is that you just have to go out and do the research to find it. You, the fleet owner, the driver, uh, anyone that, that is involved in the process needs to go out and find the solution. There is not going to be one solution to, to it. It's too big of a problem. Um, when it comes to truck parking, I do my due diligence as the fleet owner, uh, managing my drivers to be able to find parking and help them. But at certain times, my hands are tied with other issues, and they go on and try to find it. But we've made access to trying to use these new apps and things. Uh, I've even gone in a partner back in California uh, as a partner with someone to, to secure four acres of truck parking uh, and put an investment into the truck parking solution myself. Um, just because it is such a big problem, but it's it's seeing we're seeing more and more of the paid parking and things like that, where it's going to become inevitable that that free land is going to dry up. So the quicker I think more people start adhering to that, finding parking solutions, and then searching for the cheaper solutions and the harder to find spots, and then it's going to become uh, a little bit better as we go along and find more of it. But until then, until people start freeing up their lots, freeing up their warehouse space of, of places they're not using, and that's what we're seeing in some of these apps, is they'll take a spare spot they have in their warehouse that they're not using or their warehouse lot or out in their yard, and they'll put it on these Airbnb-type parking apps, and then they'll actually rent those spaces out for parking. So the, the, the solutions like that, little to big, um, are, are going to make a big difference across the board, and everyone's going to have to do their work to find the, the right parking solution. Uh, and Henry wants to add to that. Really, to me, the parking issue, there's there's an overlying thing. 
and when you study the history, the, the problem is the truck stops became used as terminals for many of the trucking companies. Prior to deregulation, most of the people went in there, they ate. We didn't have the big sleepers we have now. They, they patronized the restaurants. There's just no money in parking. One of the figures from doing research in it that I found was interesting, just to maintain the average truck stop parking spot at a truck stop is $23 a day. There's a lot of things that we don't see in it. The monitoring their groundwater, they got to dredge out the bio ponds with them, and that's millions of dollars. There's just not enough money in truck parking, and if we don't support parking, it, it costs me more to park my car if I go downtown than it does to park a tractor trailer. There's our answer. How many parking spots would be in a city at a football game? It costs more to park for a football game. You know, to, to me, that's been the biggest problem with truck parking. There is no market or profitability in it. He knows. Okay. I think one of the key things that have worked for myself is, yeah, everybody says there's a parking issue, but what I have found that works for me is the first thing I do is I look to see where I'm going to either deliver or where I'm going to be picking up. I call the shipper or the receiver, see if they even have parking. And if they do, great. If it works out that I can be at either end and have overnight parking, it's great. See what they got for amenities. If I can't go there and I'm situated in a situation where I can't be at a truck stop, then I go try to get to a rest area. But if I can't get to any of those, say there's a Walmart. We all got Trucker Path app. We look on it, we can see that they have parking or no parking. I have found that if they say no parking available, nine times out of ten, if you call, say, hey, I'm going to be out of hours, I'd also like to stop and do a little bit of shopping, whether it's $10 or $50. But like Henry said, patronize them. You would be surprised at how many times they will say, yes, you can park here. Then the next question is, where would you like me to park? And is there a time I need to be out of there? If for some reason that don't work, if you're at home and you're trying to scramble for a place to park, you, you know, you want to be able to park at home, check and see what the local ordinances are, see what your city government says, then see if there's an issue that noise could be an issue as far as your APU running or your truck going to need to be idling or for whatever reason. But I think the secret is don't be afraid to ask for permission. Yeah, you might get told no, but you might get told yes. You don't know unless you ask. But if you ask and you get permission, do it no different than you would if you were a sportsman out hunting, fishing, whatever the case may be. Leave it cleaner than you found it. Henry's a great advocate for that. He has posted many, many times where he goes into a shipper or receiver and seals, broken seals all over the ground. The seals in your hand on the back of your trailer literally to pop it. Why let it go to the ground and spend the energy to pick it back up? Put it in the garbage can. Same way at Walmart parking, same way at the truck stop. How many times you go into the truck stop and there's trash all over the place? I have watched drivers drop the garbage outside the door. We wonder why we don't have parking in some place. Sometimes we might be our worst enemy. But at the same time, again, don't be afraid to ask. Shane, you want to add anything to the parking I kind of agree with Henry, the, the truck parking. I know a lot of people complain about the reserved parking and paying for parking, and it's just, it's just not going to be free going forward. Just, we're going to have to start paying, and I think that's the future. And I think a lot of these apps, like Jimmy was talking about, where people are coming up with extra space to park, uh, I think it might be the, the answer we're looking for for the future. All right, thank you. Anybody else in the parking? All right, any questions from the audience? You, sir. So current trucks, their reliability and efficiency compared to trucks five to 10 years ago, correct? All right. It's improved quite a bit. And even five or, t you gotta go back more than 10 years ago where that was the real major problems. But the biggest problem is people don't educate themselves on how it works. 
and I'm going to say from one brand because I'm with Freightliner what I do, but one, one of the greatest assets that's out there is the Smart Source app. Get it on your phone. It has the training to the VIN number right to that truck. Most of them, when they run into a problem, is because it wasn't being used properly to begin with. So that's the biggest thing that I see. And on emissions, trucks never liked being idled. They really don't like it now. So it was never a good thing. And well, I got a kick because I do a lot of truck shows. I think it was a 1909 model Mac. And inside it, it had a brass tag for all the instructions. I guess they had a problem with guys were bad about not reading instructions. But they had these brass tags. The owner's manual was printed to the wall. But one of the main things it said in all sorts of locations all around that little C cab truck was do not idle. They're still fighting that battle. But I have, I, I look at mine, I haven't had that many problems. Uh, well, I haven't really had any to speak of other than regular maintenance. And I just had a set of friends that had an older model Cascadia that they treated right from day one. They didn't idle. They just traded that truck in and it had a million two hundred thousand miles on it. Still had the original clutch and the automated manual transmission. But I've known other people that didn't use it right and knocked one out in fifty thousand miles. Learn how to use it, use the resources that the all the manufacturers put out there. In Freightliner's case, it's the Smart Source app. You put in the VIN number of the truck, it will be for that truck. You don't know what you don't know till you find out what you didn't know. I'll address something there. I was talking with a friend, and he said he was constantly fighting the truck. Automated manual transmission. He wanted to run at 1,600 RPMs because he knew that's where everything should be. Once I explained, no, you're in a downsped. It really wants to run at 1,200 RPMs. Saw him a couple weeks later, and he came up and said, Joel, that five-minute talk we had did me very well. I'm not fighting the truck anymore. It's a pleasure to drive. So like Henry said, learn how to work your own truck. Joel, in your case, before you got your truck, how much time did you spend studying the videos before you ever got the truck? <laughs> but because of that, you've had great results with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to wait about eight months before I got my first Cascadia. I, through Henry, I knew the Freightliner had put all the short videos out of all the different tech pieces, like the integrated power management, um, how to, the automated transmission. Um, I watched them you know, at every weekend because I'd pick up one little more tidbit. So when I finally got the truck, I knew how to run it. It worked very well. All, all of this goes back to our motto or, or our, the topic of our speech, you, you learn and adjust. And, and everybody here has had to, for the most part, has had to come from a truck with a manual transmission and a 19, 2100 RPM engine down to these newer downsped engines. Well, Lynn and I just got rid of it out of uh, 2019 and are get with an auto shift transmission and getting into a 01 Mac with a manual transmission, no air ride, dump truck. <laughs> so we're actually going backwards and uh, it's, it's actually been a challenge. We, we got used to the adaptive cruise control and all of the the really good stuff that's on the newer trucks, stepping backwards 20 years is, is it's, it's been a challenge. It's been a good thing, but it's been a challenge. But we're adapting, we learned, and, but that's where I started out back in the 80s is working on Mack trucks. And because of his experience, none of the, us are following them. <laughs> And to speak towards the efficiencies of, of five years to a decade ago as of today in the trucks today, um, even in the 20 years I've been driving, uh, you see a huge difference in the adaptation of technology. But all the technology in the world 
will only get you so far when it comes to efficiency. So even these newer trucks, it's only about how you approach it. You have to adapt and you have to implement and, and you have to do it smartly. So the thing to do is educate yourself. Be careful of how you educate yourself on the technology because a lot of times, what's the first thing you do when you want to learn something? I'm guilty of it too. YouTube, right? Okay. YouTube certified mechanic, YouTube certified painter, YouTube certified everything right here. But the thing to do is watch out with the education you get from these online methods because what's going to happen is there's so much false information out there as well as good information. So utilize your OEMs, utilize the manufacturers. Make sure you're getting the right information because if you put the wrong input in, you're going to get the wrong input out or output out uh, when it comes to thoroughput. You want to make sure that you research like Joel did. You want to make yourself uh, adapt to that truck, the technologies, use them uh, the way they were designed, and don't try to fight them. You get a lot of people trying to fight the technologies of the newer trucks, and as they get newer, they get more technology. This is an ine inevitable evolution that we're seeing in all these trucks. So make sure you know what systems you're getting and make sure you know how to use them efficiently and not just get in and go. Uh, that's, that's where the efficiency is really optimized with the newer trucks. All right. Did you have a question? So the the question is regarding parking. Should the federal government be more involved in finding a solution to the parking issue? Correct. Yeah. All right. I'll take that right now. No. Because, number one, it should be a free enterprise. We have a problem. We need to find our own solutions, but we might have to be willing to pay for it. The second part of my answer is, tell me a federal program that actually works very well. We have had states actually call us and been on phone calls with us and asked us, what can we do to help you guys park? And a lot of the solutions are your rest areas. You've got a lot of green area that you're not using for anything. Maybe put in a few more parking spots for trucks. That right there helps tremendously. I mean, like the state of Indiana on I-70, they basically doubled their truck parking they bought a little more land behind it, and they switched where trucks parked and where cars parked, but they doubled their parking. And we had other states call us and say, well, hey. And we basically said, well, look at Indiana. See what they did. Because they, they doubled their truck parking in the rest areas, and that right there is a big, huge help for places to park. Following up on that, what Sandy said, Missouri called us not just the parking, they asked, asked us what amenities we would like to see in the rest areas. What was the most important things we would like to see in, in those rest areas also besides the parking? We have a little bit of disagreements on this because I don't want the states or the government to provide any of our parking spots because they never spend money efficiently. It's a private industry thing. We're a private industry. Let us solve our own problems. The more we keep them out of it, the better we are. All right, great question, thank you. Other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. So the question was, how did you guys go about forming this group, and how can she go about forming a similar group for a smaller type business? How do they get the help? Where do they go for something like that? The foundation of this group came back way back. It was the 20 group, and it was actually Kevin Rutherford's idea 
that does all the latch truck stuff. And car dealerships do the same thing. It's called a 20 group meeting, where you have groups of people that aren't competing with each other, because we're from all over the country, but we have a conference call once a week. In our case, it's every Tuesday at 2.30 when I remember it, or I remember the time zone right. But, and, we, and we get together and it's just a sharing situation. You know, who do we have on? You know, is a government regulation changing? Okay, we might lobby for what we want, but once we got the rule, we got the rule. Do we have to figure that rule out perfectly? No, but we need to figure it out better than our competitor did. And that's the sort of thing that we do. It's like, how do we make this rule work once now that we have it? When the 14-hour rule hit, that was a big one. But amongst us, we found out how to navigate that better than our competitor did. Because our competitor had the same rule. If you sit and you're looking for a way to make things not work, that's what you're going to find. That's part of our name now that it's became solutions. We're looking for a solution how to make it work. Not always perfect, but all you got to do is be better than the other people to be first. So uh, when it comes to the root of your question, uh, how do you form a group like this? That's, that's the importance of why we're up here with everybody, too, is to show you that um, not everybody knows everything. The minute you start thinking you know everything about the industry, you probably need to get out the seat and get out the industry because it's always an ever evolving, ever learning thing. You're taking the first steps now by being at a truck show like this to forming a group. A lot of us met through truck shows just like this, um, going to them all over the country and, and meeting each other. So we're all from all over the country and being able to have social media now is key as well because you can find those groups, you can go on, find people and then bring them to your own group. Let's say you wanna start your own trucking solutions type Facebook group and then invite people in that you know. You meet through the industry, shaking hands and, and doing things like that. So it, you're already taking the best step you can getting out there and networking. And, and then you take it from external networking like this and bring it internal. And you start going by word of mouth and being able to have additions that way. We refer new members into the group that way that we find out there in the industry, that we stumble across, shake hands and meet people. And then if we find that they have the same commonalities as all us share, and, and, and the witty banter is, is, is where it all is, is, is matters. Find people you get along with. Find people you can pick on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> find people you can, you can, you, you can not, you know, we don't get offended. All of us, we, we, we go pretty hard at the witty banter on these calls. <laughs> and, and you can, you can see whether it's based on someone's height or someone's age or someone's, uh, uh ability to miss the calls so much. Uh, like, like, I don't know who that might be, but um, it's, it's definitely something that you want to find people you get along with, share commonalities, and then find your own solutions to your problems. Because no one will ever know, uh, not, not one person will ever know everything in trucking. Adding to what you said, Jimmy, make sure that your group is diverse. Like we've had reefers, tankers, car haulers, there's some people that have come and gone, some have retired. If, if you're all agreeing, if you're looking for people to agree with you, you're, you're not going to move forward at all. And sometimes we just end up, well, we're just going to disagree. But if, if you agree on every subject, how can you expand your horizon? Because you've just surrounded yourself with your same thoughts. So you're not going anywhere. And, and know that you're just going to, you don't have to dislike the person, you can disagree have that broadness that you can bring a new idea to the table that way. Now, to, to go on what Henry just said, surrounding yourself with like-minded people, we're, it's, it's just in life in general, but in our group, it's the same. It's just surrounding yourself with like-minded people and getting together and, and having a conference call, and, and I think the group will just build upon itself over time. So People that, that want to improve what they're doing. Not just stay the same, but want to improve and help each other improve. <laughs> so, so the reason we're laughing is on the conference call, whenever we finish speaking, we generally say over. That way everybody knows we're done talking and we don't talk over each other. And we're sitting here trying to, it's like, this, this is a passionate subject for all of us because 
we Volcom, you know, we, we were in a straight truck box, um, expedite. Uh, Henry's in a dry van running automotive freight. We got a flatbedder. Um, Joel's in a flatbed, open deck. Um, just all different segments of the industry, and we've all been different parts of the industry. I was a mechanic for 20 years before I started driving. So it's, there's all kinds of experience sitting behind the wheel of, of these trucks. And you don't have to know everything, but if you know people that know th people that they can call, you can get questions answered and, and problems solved before they become really big problems for you. All right. Um, other questions in the audience? Okay, thank you. Yes, great question. Okay, um, moving on. This is an interesting question. <clears throat> Are there still good rates to be had? I heard a no out in the audience, but I just, I personally disagree, but go ahead. I will uh, answer that question. Is there good freight rates? Then you hear people ask, don't haul cheap freight, or there's cheap freight out there, or what is cheap freight? Well, first of all, I'm going to say my definition of cheap freight is anything that doesn't pay the bills. What are your bills? Truck, fuel, insurance. Uh, you name it. But, uh, you know, we're all seeing a downturn in the economy right now. And I can honestly sit here on this stage and tell you that in 20 years, it'll be 20 years come October. I set a record in January. What did I do? Just like the title of our subject here. Learn and apply, learn and adapt. During COVID, I, I've got a regular customer, still do. I could take a load out. I had a load before I left the house coming back. I could go out and back, burn and turn, doing really good. Right now, I have learned to maybe run a triangle. I may go out, go somewhere 500 miles down the road, and work my way back. Uh, maybe it's LTL freight. Uh, maybe it's, you know, a situation where it's a short mile trip that they need it there the next morning. You know, got to be versatile and you got to look outside the box. Now, granted, you're going to have to be a better business manager in this particular environment. As I was talking to some individuals this morning, uh, you know, it used to be whatever that load, if it was the best paying load, I'd grab it. Whether I had to bounce 100 miles or 200 miles, I knew I was going to be safe. Now, profit margins are tighter. I'm looking at my total deadhead once I get empty and what my deadhead is once I get that load, what's it going to be to the next spot. Needing to know what your operating costs are. But probably one of the best tools I learned at one of the seminars here back in, I think it was 09 or 2010, uh, put on by one of the vendors here. And it was about negotiating with a broker. No different than we're all doing here. We're building relationships. No different than the vendors that we get on calls. Build that relationship. Build that trust. Don't hesitate to maybe reach out to a regular customer that you can haul for. But in order to do so, you need to sell yourself. What is it that you can offer them? that necessarily your competitor don't have. Now, in my situation, I run a step deck, but I run a specialized step deck, I like to say. I'm running a low profile step deck. I've got ramps, I've got levelers, I've got chains, I've got specially ordered tarps that I've ordered that are six foot drops, but I've got extensions on them to make them 10 and 11 foot drop tarps. I can dabble in some of the other specialized freight that a lot of step decks drivers can't do. So I think it also, if you're using the load board, as Henry said, go back and do the research how to use them. Reach out to those individual industry leaders. See what they got for webinars, training videos. 
don't hesitate to ask. Reach out to those individuals. If they don't have an answer, no different than we're doing up here. Ask questions. But I got to admit, I've done very well. And I picked up, you know, a nickname back in 08, 09, because I had to do the same thing then. We went through a downturn. I was nicknamed the Beagle at that point in time. I was sniffing out loads that nobody else was doing. Even a carrier I was leased to at the time couldn't believe it. Where are you finding this? Look, look, don't be afraid to ask. And just because a broker's got a load posted at $2 a mile, I'll be the first one to tell you. Joel can attest to it. I'm asking for two fifty and three. What is the worst thing they can tell you is no. And I have a true example of I did a load for TQL back in uh, COVID, back in 20, 2020. I was sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, going to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I call. First question they ask, like they always ask you, what's the best rate you can do it for? My question was, well, first of all, what is it? Is it legal? Tarp? I'm asking all the details I need to ask. Found out that it was a partial load. Great. I can put more freight with it. Well, he turned around and responded back, well, I need it there Monday morning, and it's on Friday afternoon. Light bulb's going off. Oh, you want expedited specialized service. You want it there right away. I can't find anything else to go with it. So I had a price in mind. He said, what would you have? I said, I want $5,000. And he's like, well, I can't do that. He said, I was hoping to get it for twenty-five, dollars But he said, how about if I meet you in the middle at $3,700? Guess what? I took it. Because it was way more than he was willing to give. But I also had the argument with that very broker. Look at my record with you. Have I ever been late on a pickup? Have I ever been late on a delivery? Have you got any claims on me? Nope, everything looks great. Have I ever canceled a load? Nope. Those are the things that will separate you from your competitor. So when it comes to is there great freight rates out there anymore? They're not great freight rates, but are there still good freight rates out there? Yeah. Um, the way I look at it is you have to look at the situation, look at the time, uh, look at your relationships, like like we just mentioned. Uh, the, the the relationships are key. You made those relationships as a as a small business, small fleet, single truck owner operator. Keep them, keep them in your back pocket, treat them well, and they'll rely on you. Um, are are we looking at things at a different light now? Yeah, we are. Um, but is it is it to where you can't negotiate still? No, you can still negotiate. You can negotiate as much as you want. Uh, Educating yourself on the loads that you're taking, educating yourself on what you're doing, asking the questions. That's where a lot of people are so quick to jump on. Oh, here's the market average, and this from point A to point B, I'll give you this. Or, or just pick up the phone. Yeah, I'll do it. No, that's the worst thing to do. You get yourself into sticky situations that cost you time, and time is money. So what you want to do is make sure you have those relations. We, we have a mixed volume of freight. We have direct customers, and then we haul some spot freight. And it just depends on where we're going. We've diversified ourselves to where what we can do is take a lane that, that was not even something I would have considered our trucks running two or three years ago, um, taking a one-off haul for one of our direct customers and it becoming our primary business. So over the past, you know, six months, something I wouldn't have considered ever doing with our trucks has become our bread and butter because of a relationship I've made before in the past. Now they're relying on us. Uh, they're paying for the service that we give them. And, and that's what we continue to do. Uh, I like to under promise over deliver. So we like to make sure that, you know, we're not making commitments we can't adhere to, but at the same time, over deliver, give them more than they were expecting. And they're gonna wanna come back to you. I've got probably 500 emails I go through a day with just offers from people I've worked with in the past, direct customers and brokers. And I got to filter through that and see what matches up to what my trucks do. And I go back to them and, you know, we'll go back and forth. It's almost like uh, Pawn Stars, you know, where you go in there and uh, what do you want to do it? You make an offer, you automatically know they're going to come back to you and cut you in half. I mean, that's just the given nature of the business. That's the nature of the beast. Um, but where you want to make sure to set yourself up for is not failure. You know, don't be the lowest priced carrier. That, that's, that's been one of my secrets. Be the best running carrier. And if what I know, my operational costs are not going to be met by this specific load, 
I'm not going to take it out of desperation. I'll let someone else drive themselves out of business, literally. I'll answer that one for myself and I think for Shane. We're both leased to different companies, but we trust the company to give us good rates. And, you know, they've a set rate with a great fuel surcharge and tarp fees, in my case, as a flatbedder, goes a really long ways. I think Shane would agree with that, too. Um, at, at my company, we um, train everybody to run smarter and not harder all the time. Good times, bad times. Run smarter, not harder. So, And I love the... Um, um, ask, always ask, always, always, always ask, because the worst anybody can ever tell you is no, or maybe hell no. It's the worst they can tell you. So always ask, always negotiate. All right, anybody else want to comment on that question? Henry? It's funny when they talk about the depressed freight rates, because I haven't worked the spot market in close to 20 years. I haven't hardly used a broker in the last 20 years. I've worked hard towards having contract customers. And when everybody, when the spot market was just soaring, yeah, I was a little jealous, but I'm like, after a bit they're gonna be calling me and saying, how do you get those contracts? Well, I, you know when it was real busy for the spot market? That's when you get those contracts. And I've been smooth and steady through it all, but I didn't jump off and leave them when the spot market was way high. All right, do we have any other questions out in the audience? Yes, sir. All right, what do we think about double brokers? I think I addressed that a little earlier, and I'm sorry if you just got here, but um, I was actually at a seminar earlier this week, and uh, we had talked a little bit about it. Number one, it's illegal to double broker. If you see it going on, report it to FMCSA. That, that's the best advice I can give you in that situation. But I think the first thing to think of is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, there's a lot of dispatch services that are picking up the phone, robocalling all of us. I, I, I don't even do anything with them. I always, they, they always make a promise that they, I know they can't keep. And I re reply, I don't think you can beat what I'm doing because I'm already doing that. I'm already doing better than what they can offer me. As uh, some of us have said, some of us have got direct freight, so that helps. But I think the key is do the research, check them out. If you got somebody that calls you and said, hey, I can offer you this, if you think it's double broker, get their MC number, get their name, phone number. You can Google that stuff up and look up the phone number and see if it's legit. But if you get their MC number, all you got to do is go to FMCSA, the safer, and you can check in, run that number. You can also check and see if their bond is current. You can see if their insurance is current or if it's about to expire. Because I've ran in them situations. I had a situation about six, seven years ago where a broker was about three months old. They actually got stiff because a carrier had picked up a load, took it out east, and ended up being the wrong product that they were supposed to take. I said, yep, I'd bring it back. And as it turned out, somebody had to get uh, figure out who was going to pay for the backhaul to bring it back. And I had to go against the bomb, but they were still legit. But it was a situation to where, had I done my research, I would have seen that they were fairly new. I maybe wouldn't have done that very load just because of how new they were. So, again, on the double brokering, if it sounds too good to be true, just check it. And to follow up on that, uh, one of the things you can do, uh, your due diligence when it comes to sniffing out the double brokers is, uh, I know everybody likes to use DAT credit average and DAT credit ratings, but uh, be careful of those being skewed or even reviews being skewed. Uh, they pay people to go in and make good reviews on them. That's very misleading. Uh, there are not only resources you can use to, to that are free. I mean, well, free for us. We have a fueling program, and we have an option to use their credit checking service. Um, you can use paid things. I've gone online and seen this one that we're starting to try. It's a paid service where you can uh, credit check a broker. But what I recommend is for the, like what we do with our spot freight. I credit check anybody I've never done business with, and I have certain criteria. If they don't meet it, I don't care how good the load is. I'm not going to take it. 
So definitely due diligence against double brokers. And what do I think about them? The first thing I do when I call and I, I sniff out something, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm the first one to go digging. And I, I think it's one of the worst things in the industry right now. It's, it's definitely hurting a lot of people and, and hurting a lot of carriers that aren't getting paid for loads that they did the hard work for. Uh, to kind of touch on what uh, Jimmy just said, you know, on the credit check. Um, through Internet Truck Stop, and I'm sure Dad and so forth has got it, but if, uh, for instance, Internet Truck Stop, I'll use them because that's who I use quite a bit, uh, has a factoring service called Truck Stop Factoring. If you subscribe to them, you don't pay anything to be able to be set up with the factoring uh, option. But what I like about having them in my back pocket is they have a credit checking tool, and you run the MC number. It'll tell you if it's approved, conditional, or no, can't, can't do it. And I'm sorry, if they won't do it, why should I do it? Because they're, they're, uh, they got risk out there of a no recourse that they're going to guarantee the money if you haul it, providing it's approved. That's another resource. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if that's not the resource you got, as Jimmy said, just run credit checks or get the, uh, the MC number or phone number. Let's, because I know it's happening to the large med mega carriers. Somebody will call up and say, well, I'm with uh, XYZ company, and I'm so-and-so, and this is the phone number. Turn around and call that number back. See if it's the same person that answers. That's easy to do, too. Good. Yeah. All right. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's the best way to get set up with the shipper if you're if you are a small fleet for as an owner operator all right that's been my specialty over the years and i had the advantage from where i worked prior to being an owner operator i not only drove a truck for a private carrier but i ran their freight desk so when you walk in everybody wants to go in hey you got any freight why do they want to use you they already got somebody else hauling their freight. What makes you special? Of course, everybody's going to say, oh, I'm professional, I'm on time. Trust me, nobody ever came up to the desk and told me that they were professional most of the time, and they were usually on time. So that's, that's the standard bar stuff. Like one of the things I did is I'd give them an introductory offer. If somebody, a different toothpaste company, wants to try and lure you to it, they give you a free sample. Or maybe they give you an introductory offer. It's good for two weeks. That gives you a chance to get in there because you're going to have to go in on rate to begin with unless you just happen to walk in the door and they really needed somebody. That's not the norm. Normally, there's other people doing it, and you've got to either boot them out of the way or one way or the other, right? So if you come in with an in introductory rate, maybe it's good for two weeks, whatever. It gives you a chance to see what it really takes to do their business. It gives you a chance to make an impression on their customers that they're calling back it and saying, I don't know your name, but we'll make it Bill. Send Bill, right? So, and that has paid off so much dividends, and I always looked for the customer. I always asked them, give me the customer that complains every shipment that they get. And, and I'll be there when they want me to be, and I come walking in with a box of donuts the first time. How can they be too irritated when I'm walking, hey, I'm going to be bringing the freight, you know? And usually that leads to them calling back and saying, you know that person you sent last time? Keep sending them because you solved the problem. You got, we're here to solve a problem. The main problem is to get freight from here to there. But if you make one of their problem customers no longer a problem, you, where do you think you get to go with the rate after the introductory rate? Because now you've got the upper hand on the negotiation. And, oh, one other thing. What, what, what are they called? The sick codes. Over. I, I, and it's probably online because I haven't had to do it for years. Look up the standard industry codes and look up the businesses that you're interested in. It'll have their credit rating, how many employees they have, everything about that company, the key contact people. And when you walk in the door, know as much as you can about the shipper. Oh, I've seen you've been in business since 1938. This is a third generation. It shows that you took interest before you walked in the door to know something about them, not, you have any freight for me to haul? I'm pretty professional, and I most likely will get it on. No, that didn't go. You see where I'm going with that? But use the resources that are out there. It's much easier. I had to go to the public library when I started doing that. It was all microfilm. 
but I have enough customers. That, yeah, I'm dating myself. That's terrible. <laughs> but that stuff's, well, you can probably find it on your phone now, but that's it. Over. <laughs> What's microfilm? Okay, so my, 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 my thing is, um, no, oh, it's a big computer looking thing that takes up half a room. Uh, so to, to elaborate on that a little further, I'll give you a tip. Uh, when it comes to being a small fleet or an owner operator going after, I, I like to fish. I'm a trout fisherman. What I relate to in this scenario is when you go out, and whether it's a tournament or you're fishing for your champion prize, what do you want in that pond? You want the big fish. Okay, but guess what? All those megas and all those thousand truck fleets want the, they want the big fish too. And they've got the means to get it. They've got the fish finders. They've got every tool in their tack tackle box. But what happens if you're trying to feed yourself? This is your business. You're trying to feed yourself instead of go after that trophy. A whole bunch of little fish are going to cook up a whole lot more meat than one trophy. Go after the small shippers. Go after the one truck or one dock, two dock, three dock places, the mom and pops. That's where I've landed all my directs. That's the best thing you can do. And they, more, more often than not, will savor a good service over a good price. I think to add to that, like in my case, I, I knew that the particular customer I currently have had existed by doing a, a load off a board. And uh, going in there, and I provided a good service. But also... I had some customers that they had that were asking me to go in and pick up as well. And between the combination of those two interactions, it became a conversation. Hey, will you go here? As like Henry said, don't hesitate to take the lane that nobody else wants and provide the utmost service that you can do. And as Jimmy said earlier, under promise, overachieve. If that particular customer says, ask you when you can have it there, I might say it'll be there Friday, but I'll get it there Thursday afternoon. Number one, my particular receiver is going to be excited because it's there early, providing I call them ahead of time because that's the other thing. Communication is key. Always call your shipper. Get in there, see what they got, get directions, ask everything about them. Same way on the receiving end. I always call ahead of time, two, three days, give them an ETA when I'm going to be there. If you run behind, call them. Hey, you know what? I'm not going to quite be there as I promised because I ran into a snafu or I blew a tire, whatever the case may be. Always stay in contact with them. But I think the other key to that as well is when COVID was here, rates were through the roof. In the five-plus years that I've had this customer, I've never once went in and said, I need more money. It's always the shipper is contacting me. Hey, what are you seeing for freight rates? What are you seeing? What do you think we need to do? We know fuel's gone up. Are you okay with this rate? Yeah. Knowing that now that the market has took a downturn, I am still above the market average for that particular lane by 50 cents a mile. I am still above the market average. Why? Number one, I didn't go in there and skyrocket the rates. But at the same time, I'm still providing a good service. And I will tell you that they've had two large carriers come in there and try and take freight away from us. There was one local carrier that was in there just grumbling because, oh, Swift came in here. And it was true. Swift did come in there. Another large carrier came in there. I'd asked the sh shipping manager, I noticed you got these in here. Well, they got capacity. Guess what? They got one carrier had 250 trucks, and the other carrier's got 3,000. You know who had the capacity? I did. Why did I have the capacity? Because that customer is my bread and butter. I have passion in the product that they sell and ship, and they know that I'm coming back to take care of them. I also, when I deliver to the dealer that the products go to, I don't hesitate to get dirty and say, hey, where's your impact so I can help you put tires on? It's trailers that I haul. I'll help them put tires on. Why do I do that? I don't have to. But instead of taking two hours to get unloaded, I might get unloaded in an hour. And I might get a free bottle of water or a cup of coffee or whatever the case may be. As Henry said, don't hesitate to take them a box of donuts. What I do for my customer every year at Thanksgiving and Christmas, I say, hey, when are you having your big party, Thanksgiving party or Christmas party? The day before or the day after, I order pizza for the whole... Over. We would like to thank you all for joining us. For those headed to the LB Shade and Tony Justice concert presented by DAT.
But I, I guess the key to it is show appreciation to the customer that you're working with. Let them know that you appreciate their business, and they'll return it in favor back to you. All right, Henry, wrap it up there. The, the real key I found was, for myself, was to look for shippers that didn't ship more than 10 loads a day. Later on, I got some of them big fish ones where I was the only single truck operator in big, big, and had some of the big fish. But 10 and under seemed to be the key. All right. Hey, I want to thank everybody, everybody on the panel here for helping out today. The audience, thank you so much. And I'm going to let Joel here wrap things up for us, and thank you again. We had a couple of our guest speakers here earlier. Unfortunately, I think they had to run back to their booth. If you go and see Gearhead Lube and Mother Trucker Yoga over in their booths in the West Wing, just tell them, hey, we gave them a shout-out today. Thanks, everyone. And we'll stick around if you have some more questions. <laughs>